Okay, morning everybody. Um, usually I get to, to train on how to do an IR in a, a few hours or even a day session. And today it's just 45 minutes, which is probably actually a reflection of the speed of time and change nowadays. Okay, so I'll take you through what I see as the seven wondrous rules of preparing this marvelous corporate tool, which we call the integrated report. And at the end of the session, um, I'll give you my views on how I see the integrated report and how it shapes up in this time of crisis. Okay, so first of all, just a reminder of what an integrated report is. We see the integrated report as a jolly fine read. Sorry. As a jolly fan read, it's concise and readable. So the integrated report is the first thing you should read when you want to learn about a company. It tells you all the material information. So it's going to tell you about strategy, governance, performance, and prospects, and all of that in the context of the company's external environment, because no man is an island. It's all about six capitals and value creation, and because it covers multi-capitals, we see the integrated report as the whole of the cake with financial information just being one slice of the cake, sustainability information, yet another slice, et cetera. So in this picture here, this singular slice of cake would be the old style annual report with financial information. And it's probably highly indigestible to most people and tending them to what becoming gluten intolerant. Okay, so my wondrous rule number one, it's as simple as follow the international framework. Honestly, sometimes I think that this framework is a truly divinely inspired piece. So take a thorough read of it. I think that everything you need to know and about integrated reporting and integrated thinking is in the framework. There are three major sections of the framework, fundamental concepts, which underpin everything, the guiding principles and the content elements. The guiding principles tell you what information to put in your integrated report and the content elements tell you where to put it. The principles and the content elements fall into the framework's 19 requirements, which should be met if you say that your integrated report has been prepared in accordance with the international framework. The framework is accepted around the world as best practice. It currently is a global best practice. It was released by the IRC, which is a multi-stakeholder body. And I see the strength of the IRC lies in its independence and the fact that it is an umbrella body with all detailed information standards and standard setters leading up to the integrated report. So a tip for new reporters is that the IRC of South Africa has developed a very useful starters guide and that is available on our website. And a point to note, if you wanted to mention it, the framework is currently being tweaked. The new consultation draft, which is coming out tomorrow and it's breaking news, it's out tomorrow. There are no major changes in the consultation draft because this wasn't, you know, a, a, a thorough revision. It was just merely an, an update and a tweaking. So the two areas that were sent out into topic papers earlier this year for consultation were the board responsibility statement and the improvements in explaining the business model. Now, both of those will be covered in the consultation draft. Consult consultation draft open for 90 days up until 19th of August and will be available on the IIRC website and the IRC of SA website. So on to my wondrous rule number two. Understand the concepts. Really take the time to understand the three fundamental concepts. They are all connected and everything else builds on them and they build on one another. So see the guiding principles and the content elements as the practical application of these concepts and they give you a thorough grounding by understand them. So take the time to understand them. So I want to go through 
the first one, which is six capitals. These have been mentioned before, but I want to make some important points here, points that I think are important to understand in them. See the capitals as a classification system for all the resources and relationships your company uses and affects. Now, when South Africa came out with the world's first discussion paper on the integrated report, we referred to the term resources and, and relationships. So when it went up to international IRC level, they used our discussion paper as a basis for the international framework and they didn't um, really favor the term resources and relationships. They wanted something which I think that they felt was a bit more academic. So they came up with six capitals. It is just a classification system. Some people get, you know, a bit hit up and about this and, and see it as, as a major scientific thing. It's not, it is just a classification system. See them as your resources and your relationships. So it's important to know that the capitals extend to what you own, but also what you don't own as a company. For example, a transport company uses public roads and hence that is included in their manufactured capital. The second point I want to make is that the definition of, of each of these capitals that you see here, which is based on the framework, they can be changed. So for example, you might want to move brand and reputation out of social and relationship capital and move it into, into intellectual capital, which I think is actually a better placement for it. But if you do change, so if you do deviate from the definitions in the international IR framework, and I think explain that in your integrated report, that would be seen as, as, as good practice. A third point I want to make on the six capitals is that some companies think that you have to structure your report around the six capitals. You do not. But uh, some experienced reporters in South Africa that have been using this structure for their report say that it's a very good check of completeness. And actually, that is the real purpose of these six capitals. It is a completeness check for you to check that you've covered all of your resources and relationships, your uses and impacts in your integrated report. So see it as a completeness check and they're also used for the other two fundamental concepts. So as I see it, all six capitals, would be relevant and significant to all organizations. Can you really say that water use and impacts is not important? A couple of years ago, some retailers in, in Cape Town said, well, you know, we're not, we're not um, disclosing and we don't see water as important because we have such a minimal use and minimal impacts. And then the Cape Town drought hit and now those companies no longer say it. So, I think that every organization, especially in the world that we're living in now, should see as all six capitals relevant to, the all, to that organization and they should be included in the integrated report. And the, the fifth point I want to make on capitals is that they're all connected. They are all interconnected. And this horrible virus that we're seeing right now is just reminded us that all the capitals are connected. So moving to the next fundamental concept of value creation. Now, if you don't listen to anything else I say, please, please listen to this because it saddens me so much that after 10 years of integrated reporting, there is still misunderstanding of what this is. But watch out for the consultation draft um, coming out tomorrow because we have put in there some, some just improvements to explaining the business model, which hopefully will also address this confusion about value creation. So I want to go through what it is and what it's not. The crux is it's the effects your company is having on the six capitals from just being in existence and selling your products and services. It is the effects on those capitals. 
when we developed the framework 10 years ago, we unfortunately focused on, on the, the term value creation. Now, we did explain in the text that value creation also covers value erosion and value preservation on the capitals. But unfortunately, we predominantly use the term value creation. And I think that's where the misunderstanding has come in. Again, that will be addressed in the consultation draft. So the King IV Code of Governance actually um, reflects it better because it refers to positive value creation and negative value creation. So instead of using the umbrella term value creation, it does identify. I think that's quite a nice way to do it. So please see value creation and value erosion as the effects or outcomes on the six capitals. They are the same thing. So formula is effects equals outcomes equals value creation and value erosion. Now, some people have stirred the pot recently and said that value creation does not cover the longer term impacts on society and environment, that it doesn't cover the longer term impacts on society and environment. Clearly, those people sitting with their pots on Mars. Effects, impacts, and outcomes are all the same thing. They all refer to the effects on society and environment, also known as six capitals. So we're not talking, we are all talking about the same thing here. Moving to what value creation is not. It is not the same as the term stakeholder value or shared value. It is not the same. Why not? Because when those terms appear in company reports, integrated reports, they usually have excluded the negative effects on the six capitals. And can a company really say that it has no negative effects? So because they're so focused on talking about shared value and stakeholder value, they've conveniently or inconveniently forgotten the negative impacts that they're having. For transparent and balanced reporting, you have to have both. Value creation is not aspirational goals. So some of the public sector reports that we're seeing, they talk about the aspirational goals, what they want to achieve. It's not that. The value creation erosion are your actual outcomes. And finally, value creation is not the value added statement that is so beloved by accountants and dreamed up by them. That's purely financial. It's all about multi capitals in this new world. Okay, so my wondrous rule number three, which is also a, a fundamental concept, is integrated thinking. Now, there is a long definition in the framework, um, which was on. The, and on one of the Fiona slides, now that definition appears in the framework and yeah, you know, with hindsight, I think that maybe you went down the wrong track because it covers two parts. One, the different departments talking to each other and two, the connectivity between the capitals. So for integrated thinking, focus on the second bit of it the interconnectivity between the capitals, because that's what integrated thinking really is. Maybe that, that definition should be switched around. Capitals first and then, then departments talking to each other second. Makes much more sense. So some companies want to employ consultants to, expensive consultants to tell them, you know, how to embed integrated thinking in their company. I really don't think that it's needed because honestly, to me, integrated thinking is common sense. It is common sense. When a human being, when you and I make a decision, we usually think about the effects or consequences in the longer term and of the different choices and we work out if we can, can live with them, the best choice for us. When a company makes a decision, it will be the same thing. They too need to think about the potential effects or consequences of particular choices on each of those six capitals. It's, it, it, it's thinking about consequences going forward and whether you're happy to live with them or not. In most cases, what the company does today will always come back to effect it positively or negatively in the future. So why would you want 
negative outcomes in the future. Just deal with it properly today, do the right thing. The crux of integrated thinking, let me reiterate, is thinking about the effects or consequences on the capitals. It is the connectivity of things. So when it comes to practical embedding, really, because I see it as such basic common sense, I don't think that you need to get all scientific about it. The only practical point that I want to add here is, is that maybe a company can see it as embedding in, in, in three different levels. So the firstly is the board, um, that should come in their strategy and their decision making. Executives and senior management, that should integrate thinking, should come into their decision making, their integrated management reporting and their review. And then at staff level, um, decision making, daily choices and maybe understanding the bigger picture of how they, they fit and their department fits into the value creation story. I've always thought that maybe a good tool is when you, know, you join a new company and they give you an, an, an induction pack. So maybe just to talk about the, the integrated thinking there so that the, the capitals that the company uses and effects so that they appreciate it as soon as that employee and day one on the job. So moving right along, how do you know when integrated thinking is achieved in your company? Well, I think that integrated thinking is really is a continuous cycle of improvement. Now, do you ever get it 100% right? I think that you, know, you learn by doing. The more that you do, the more that you get right. The experienced integrated report is in South Africa. And remember that our companies um, have been doing integrated reporting for the longest in the world, um, for about 10 or, 11, 10 or 11 years. So they say that um, preparing the integrated report each year has really helped to embed integrated thinking in their company. They say that it switched the mindset to integrated thinking. And because of that, I'm a strong proponent of not waiting until you think that integrated thinking is embedded in your company before you start preparing an integrated report. And there was this international debate going around saying you can't do an integrated report until you have integrated thinking. It's not true. South Africa proved that. Our companies 10 years ago, um, when King 4, when King 3 said do an integrated report, and the framework came out, they didn't have a chance to embed integrated thinking. They first did the integrated report, it helped them to embed integrated thinking. So I think it's pointless to wait. So those companies who want to wait, don't. Rather use the integrated report as a very useful corporate reporting tool in helping to embed integrated thinking in your company. Okay, so whose responsibility is it to manage integrated thinking and the integrated report in your company? Well, let's start off with integrated thinking. So as I see it, I think that that's the responsibility of, of everyone in the company, of every single person who works there. But you might want to um, put some incentives, remuneration incentives and performance incentives in place to make sure that it happens from the top down. That will be the board's role, the board's role to make sure that, that it gets implemented. It will be, they will delegate that authority of implementation to, to the ex executive. As far as integrated report goes, it is firmly the responsibility of the board. The integrated report is their report, it is their voice. It is a governance document. Now, in the framework, there is a, a requirement, one of the 19 requirements that the governing body, the board, should sign off on the integrity of integrated report and that it's in accordance with the 19 requirements of the framework. As I see it, the statement is absolutely crucial to the report. It is crucial to the report. Now, in reality, in, in many countries, the board would be legally responsible for a corporate reports anyway, whether they put their name to it or not. 
but it is crucial, I think, for to include that statement because of stakeholder perception. Stakeholders want to see that the company does not just regard the integrated report as, as a marketing document. They want to see that it really is a truly a transparent and balanced disclosure by the board in fulfilling its duty of accountability. That's really important for, for stakeholder perception. So watch out for the consultation draft. Um, there will be some simplification to the change to in the, in the statement of responsibility and we certainly very keen to hear your views on the simplification changes made. Moving on to my wondrous rule number five. So say hello to Alith Octopus. Mervyn King and I introduced Ali in our first book called Integrate. And the companies that use Ali say he's been extremely helpful in structuring their corporate reporting suite. So you can see here, so Ali would be the head, the integrated report with a myriad of other external reports underneath being his arms. So for instance, one would be the financial statements, one would be the sustainability report governance information, all the detailed reports, subject specific, would be sitting in, in Ali's arms. It is important for, for Ali to be seen as to structure the whole cor corporate reporting suite, but he's also important for getting a concise integrated report. So an integrated report would have all your material information that you need to understand about the company and all the detailed information we would be sitting in, in, one, in, in one of Ali's arms. So you don't want a 1,000 page integrated report. You want concise information, all the material information sitting in Ali's head and you want detailed information sitting in all those subject specific reports at the bottom. So meet Tommy the Tarantula. You can see in integrated reporting, we love animals. So Tommy is, is from the framework. And, and honestly, I think that if you understand this graphic, you will understand integrated thinking and integrated reporting. If you start on the left, it shows the inputs drawn from the six capitals they flow through the company's activities to produce outputs which are the third bubble in, in the middle and outputs are your products and services the result of that the fourth bubble are your effects impacts on the six capitals now many preparers get confused over the two o's outputs and outcomes. An easy way to remember this is that outputs can only be the products and services in waste, can only be your products and services. So that means that all the rest are probably outcomes. You can see that the gray line going along the top shows integrated thinking. Now that line shows the effects you have on your capitals being your outcomes today will come back to reward you or hurt you when you need them as your future inputs. The diagram also shows the content elements of the IR which are the seven headings in the blue circle and they're set in the overarching context of the external environment. In the consultation draft watch out for some re-engineering happening to, to to Tommy the Tarantula, but also I think really, if you just take time out to understand this, I mean, you need never look at anything else ever again about integrated thinking, integrated reporting. This is my wondrous rule number seven, the structure of integrated report. I think if you get the structure of your integrated report right, then, then your job is halfway done. If you get the structure right, it avoids duplicate information and you get to a concise and readable report. So the eight content elements are 
thoroughly flexible. You can start anywhere. You want to put strategy first, you can put strategy. You want to put governance first, you can put governance first in your report. But saying that, I think that there is a logical structure. And if you start off with a logical structure, I think that um, that you can tell your, your value creation story in a better and easier way. So what I would do is I would start with organizational overview of who your company is and what it does. I would explain the external environment, no company is the island, but importantly, how that influences the company. You've got to make that link. You can't just talk about um, global changes and not impacting that back to the company. Show the business model. You can do that in a two-page spread, a two-page diagram. Start with the material inputs from each capital. Give, um, give the rand the, the dollar figure and importantly, give comparatives because you want to see some context for the inputs. Give a page reference to your activities and products and services. Now, there's no point in putting them back into the business model when you've already covered them under your organizational overview and information. So just give a page cross-reference back because you want your business model diagram to be as simple as possible. Remember, you're trying to get things as readable as possible. And then you list the outcomes, which would be on the right-hand column positive and negative outcomes. You don't just want positive outcomes, it throws the balance of your report completely out and that affects the credibility of the report. The board's role, transparent reporting. Yeah. Behind the business model, I would put the stakeholders engagement table. And that just needs, also needs to be a two page spread, what stakeholders needs are, not what you think they are, but what they're saying their needs are and the company's response. I would then put strategy, the KPIs and the targets with the short, medium and long term. And importantly, identify which of those KPIs are used in remuneration incentive. That's a closing that value creation loop. After you've talked about your strategy, show the risks and opportunities, then give the year's performance and then the governance information and then give your outlook summary. Graham will be covering outlook a bit later on. Get your structure right. It really, if you get the skeleton right, it helps you with your integrated reporting process. So some trends that we're seeing in South Africa is that the experienced reporters are putting in a bridged governance information into the integrated report. Some governance information can be quite detailed. So some of the guys are putting in like three or four pages of, of a bridge corporate governance information and all the rest is going onto, onto the website or in a separate printed report. The same would go for remuneration report. It can be very lengthy for insomniacs. They're just putting a three or four pager talking about the essence of linking remuneration back into value creation circle. And that goes into a greater report again with a link to their website. Icons are commonly used for capitals, material matters, and strategic objectives. So that information appears throughout the report. I caution you against using icons for too many areas of the report because it can be confusing. So I think just use three and for three different areas and then actually maybe change the shape shape of each. So for readability, when you're on page 20, you can see an icon shaped in a particular style it relates to capitals. The reports are slimming down in South Africa, but certainly you know, we have some way to go there. I think that the latest magic number is get your inter integrated report down to 80 pages. Previously, we used to say 100, but it's slimming down all the time now. And, and I think that you want a readable and concise document so people actually read it. I want to address the pesky international issue of audience. And as a controversial, I know. So the framework refers to the target audience as, as providers of, of capital, of financial capital investors. In South Africa, our, our king codes is steered integrated report to, to being the company's story. Integrated report is the company's value creation story to be read by all stakeholders because it's Ali's head. 
So in the global rise in awareness that we're seeing in the last couple of years, and especially now that companies rely on multi-capitals, I really do see that the, the King Fork, the King Codes view as taking prevalence and dominance in the international field um, in the days ahead. So the issue is up for grabs um, in the topic papers that the IRC issued earlier this year for comment. It was one of, one of the issues there. So we have got the responses back from that. So it is up for grabs and international, and international debate. Now, when, so when I share that view, people often say to me, well, you know, can you really write one report for all stakeholders? for all audiences. So as a former business journalist, I can tell you that you can write a story. You write a story and you assume a certain level of business knowledge. You try not to use jargon and only wear absolutely essential and then you explain it. But you can write an integrated report assuming a general level and then deal with other specific stakeholders in that subject specific information in the arms of Ali. So, reporting in a changed world. So, I was rather tempted to, to instead of those three little words, um, OMG, to letters to use the three other little letters, <laughs> but OMG it is. We, you know, we're living in extraordinary times, and sometimes it's actually hard to believe, hard to believe that life has become like this. The preparers have asked as to where in the integrated report they should disclose virus information and effects. In my view, this is my answer to them. I think the framework is robust and perfectly framed to guide reporters because it is multi-capitals framework and because it covers the short, medium and the long term. The users of your integrated report will want to know how the virus has affected your value creation story, the changes that you've had to make as a company and your outlook. And in particular there, I think that they'll want to see the immediate short-term survival plan, which will be a focus on financial cash flow. And then importantly, the access to future capitals. I see the information coming into each and every content element of the integrated report. And then obviously it'll be one of your top material matters. And I acknowledge that it's a huge <laughs> an understatement there. Covering all of the six capitals over time will give users a much more informed view about the going concern, the nature of your company. Much better um, definition of going concern than the, than the accountants financial, do you have enough cash to the end of the year approach? And actually watch out for an FAQ. We, we come, it's coming out from the integrated report of South Africa later this year about reporting in a time of crisis. So we're currently working on that. As far as the company's point of view, as I see it, you know, they respond, how do they respond to these changes? I think companies should have a deep think of their purpose. What's good for society and the environment? Doing good for society and the environment. My purpose has been quite topical in the last few years, but it's extremely important to get this right now. Companies should be considering their negative outcomes because I think society will be less forgiving for any transgressions on negative outcomes. And in managing their six capitals and ensuring future access, I think companies will really have to look at and rely on integrated thinking. For example, they could say to themselves, well, if we do this to our employees, how will this affect the other capitals, including our reputation? And can we live with that? And what will be the longer term consequences? It's gonna be real integrated thinking in action. And all of this just, um, a hell of a reminder of the connectivity of things. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Um, Karen, do you have any questions? 
Thank you very much, uh, Lee. I think that was uh, super informative. Uh, certainly gave us a lot of guidance in terms of how we should be approaching the practicalities of this. So we've got a, a fantastic theoretical foundation, a lot of insight from Dr. Robertson, and I think you gave us the practical. So what does that mean for you know doing doing an integrated report? So thank you very much for that. Um, being CEO of the Integrating Report, Integrated Reporting Committee <laughs> of South Africa. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly you've got that insight. So thank you very much for that. Um, a couple of questions, a lot of questions have come through, um, but I've just selected a, a couple here. The one is, um, this is just to put you on the spot. Uh, can you, this is from uh, Folia. Can you kindly give an example of manufactured capital for a financial institution. I do, I do find that many organizations battle with this concept of a manufactured capital when they are um, a technology company or a financial institution. In working with organizations, have you come across what normally gets captured as a manufactured capital? Yeah, so I think yeah, companies do often get this wrong. I think you have to see it as, as you know, what we term as accountants, you know, tangible assets, your plant and, and machinery and equipment. So it's that kind of stuff, but it's also an acknowledgement of, of what you use, which is not owned by you. So I think it's easiest to understand like, if you're a logistics company and, and you use the public infrastructure, the public roads and, and, and bridges, and you do have an effect you know, potholes, you know, they're merely using them, you know, you um, increasing the impact of potholes on that. So you have to include it as part of your capital. So when it comes to, you know, a bank, a financial services company, it would also be you know, the tangible assets that they use. But I think that they should too have a look at and see what, what they use of the public in infrastructure and and what effects they're having on that. And then if it is material, then it should be disclosed. Mm. It's always Thank a hard, hard one, but what you own, what you use and affect what you don't own. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lee. Um, then here's, a, here's an interesting one. <laughs> How do you persuade companies to declare value erosion fairly and honestly? And that's from Ben. Uh, so that, that's a good one. How do you persuade companies to declare value erosion fairly and honestly? Well, <laughs> you could just mention two words, corporate governance. <laughs> Are they, you know, I mean, how the board has a duty of accountability. Accountability cannot just be for the positive effects, the positive value creation. It has to be transparent, you know, and and saying, look, these are the negative effects that we're having. This is value erosion. And this is what we're doing about it. King 4 refers to amelioration or mitigation of negative outcomes. And I think that's, so admit it, this is what we're doing. This is what we have. And this is what we're doing about it. And you should be saying mm -hmm. that in your point. And it's also one of the benefits of being transparent is, as you know, stakeholder trust increase. Of course. Of course, thanks. Um, that uh, ethical leadership bit about integrity and competence and mm -hmm. transparency and fairness, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Um, Ingrid is asking Lee, uh, is most of the report historic and how much is future oriented? Well, remember that one of the guiding principles is actually, um, you know, strategic and orientation in, in the future. So, of course, you are looking at your reporting period now. I mean, you've just done that at your reporting period. But that future information comes through everything. I mean, it comes through the external environment, what's impacting you now, what's likely to impact you going forward, um, the outcomes that you're actually having now, but the outcomes that you could see as potential going forward, your strategy, you, you talk about achievement in this year, sure, but you're also talking about short, medium, and long-term targets and KPIs in the future. And then your outlook is all about is, is, is all about the future. And of course, the risks also come into that because risks are going forward too. Mm. 
Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Here's another practical one from Amina um, Ismail. It, to what extent are environmental and social specialists part of the team preparing these reports? Well, what we see in South Africa is that it's commonplace to have an IR steering committee. So that steering committee is, is made up of all like the heads of different divisions and all different functions. So financial, definitely. Sustainability, definitely. Risks and, and opportunities. Um, governance, all of them would sit together at the table. So, you know, we shouldn't be seeing it as silo. And this is the beauty of this. They're all sitting there and, and they're seeing it as the whole of the cake. Mm. Working together. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Great, thanks. Um, specific one from Sarah uh, Katamba. In education institutions, what is the relevance of integrated reporting to the financial management of an education institution? There are um, a couple of universities. In fact, I think most of the big universities in South Africa do integrated reports. And remember, everybody should be doing integrated reports, whether you're an SME, NGO, university. It, it's a good corporate tool, no matter the type of business that, you, that, you, that you're in, the type of organization that you're in. This is, doing the integrated report is a very, very good business tool. It helps to embed integrated thinking. And you cannot just, in this day and age, you cannot just focus on financial capital. You have to see everything as connected. So integrated board, integrated thinking, important to everybody. Mm. It, it's such a fundamental uh, way of reporting and it certainly um, aggregates and for all the, as you say, all the industries, all institutions and everybody should be doing it. So the question here from Cheryl is, do you think it's actually going to report, uh, replace our traditional financial statements and its notes in, in future? Do you think it's going to override it? At the moment, it's almost like a, the second thought. Um. <laughs> well, speaking as an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I think everything has its place. You know, um, I love Ollie the Octobook, so I think it explains everything. So... You can't read the financial statements alone and, and get an understanding of the company. You have to read a report which talks about all the capitals, which is the whole of the cake. But saying that, you will always want to go down. Many users will want to go down into the financial information and probably only 10% of people who read it can actually understand it. As an accountant, I don't think I could understand it these days. Um, but you would always have to have that, but it will always have its place. But the integrated report, which is multi-capitals, short, medium, and long-term, is the umbrella report. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting question here from, from um, uh, wait, uh, that wasn't the one. Yes, so this is, this is a, a, an internal audit kind of question from Sarah. Um, how do I measure whether an organization has complied with integrated reporting? Um, she's asking, should I take each capital independently and look at how the organization has reported on it in relation to strategy, risks, opportunities, governance, resource allocations, et cetera. But that feels um, like it's not integrated thinking. So how do you measure or whether an organization has actually complied with integrated reporting? Okay, so maybe see there's two different veins with the integrated report that has to be done according to the 19 requirements. And, you know, you should have maybe a specialist come in and say, well, have you met those, uh, those 19 requirements? So maybe, you know, the internal audit function can come in there as well, have those 19 requirements being met, because remember that the board is actually putting its name to it. And then the second part of it would be the integrated reporting aspect itself. So that should be happening throughout the year, not just at the end of the year. I mean, this is changing the way that you do your internal reporting. And that internal reporting should be, what are your KPIs that you refer to in your integrated report? And those KPIs should be 
looking at positive outcomes and negative outcomes, and that's what your strategy should be. So you want reporting on those holistic APIs throughout the year. You want reporting on that so you would need systems and you would also need management reviews. So they, those holistic KPIs and performance against them need to come in monthly management reviews. And importantly, it's also got to go to the board. You don't want agenda packs for the board of, of just financial information. That doesn't allow them to make informed decisions. So you want that integrated information that um, all the KPIs, holistic KPIs in that board pack, as well as, as with, as Mervyn always refers to, um, stakeholder, stakeholder responses. What are your stakeholders feeling right now? Also important information for the board. Mm, thank you. Do you think, this is a question from Charlotte, do you think it would be audited in future in, in, in organizations integrated report? Do you think it will be audited by the audit, external auditors in future and um, some kind of a certificate going alongside it to stakeholders? It seems to be an you know, assurance global debate. It seems to be the way that it's going. Um, in the IAASB has a, has a public consultation document out on EER reporting and integrated reporting would fall into that. It does seem to be um, the way that it's going and certainly as a director I would probably like it was my company probably like and I put my name to it probably want some sort of assurance but I think it's you know it's not an easy task to do because much of the integrated report is is subjective mm. and it's not always qualitative information it's quantitative so I am supportive of assurance I am but just part of me says that I would hate to see it we get into a situation where companies don't put information, material information in their reports just because it can't be assured. I would not like that to happen. I see that as a risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just a, a final question it, well, uh, from my side. Can you just mention the book that Ollie is, um, I think Ollie's a great model and you referred to him a lot. Um, which book was it that uh, so for our attendees? Yeah. Um, so Mervyn and I wrote our book called Integrate, um, reporting the 21st century, and that was, it's by Juta, and yeah, it's pretty old now, it was actually 2013, but we're very proud that we came up with the concept of Ali, um, and we've used Ali in the FAQ, which is on the Integrate Reporting Committee of South Africa website as well.